life in prison for throwing a glitter bomb. Wait, what? I thought you said this was legal. No, Mark Rober is probably not going to jail, but two Florida women have been charged with felony offenses for allegedly throwing a glitter bomb at a man inside an apartment complex. Their arrest made headlines with some announcing that they faced life in prison for a glitter bomb. Now, while it's theoretically possible that they could face that kind of a sentence, they probably won't face anything like that, but their actions do go well beyond putting some glitter in an envelope and surprising some porch pirates. So they do face potential heavy jail time. And all of this has Twitter wondering, just what are the legal implications of attacking people with glitter? Is it illegal to send someone a box of glitter through the mail? Can you deal with a would-be thief by booby-trapping a package? Just how much money does Hobby Lobby make in glitter sales? And how do we stop Mark Rober? Today we're talking everything glitter bombs. Glitter bombs became popular about 10 years ago when some gay rights activists started throwing glitter bombs in the faces of politicians who opposed gay marriage. Some famous people have since been on the receiving end of a glitter bomb. For example, in 2012, a Boulder student was arrested for glitter bombing Mitt Romney at a Colorado campaign event. Prosecutors originally charged Peter Smith with throwing a missile at Romney, but he pleaded guilty to disturbing the peace, a lesser charge. Here, while the glitter didn't make much of a visual impact, if you throw something at a politician, you should probably expect the Secret Service to tackle you. Lindsay Lohan was on the receiving end of a glitter bomb while she was on her way to court. As you can see, the use of the glitter looked more like rice or confetti, and I guess the message was congratulations on your jail time. Glitter bombing celebrities and politicians was all the rage for a couple of years in the early aughts. This being America, the glitter bomb fad encouraged a few enterprising souls to turn glitter bombing into a business. Websites popped up all over the place allowing you to send a glitter bomb through the mail. Just pay $39.99, enter an address, and presto, you've just pranked someone. So at first glance, this all just seems like harmless fun. Glitter is a pain in the ass to clean up, but beyond that, what's the harm? Amazon even sells something called unicorn snot, which is described as quote, biodegradable holographic body glitter gel for body, face, and hair. So it's safe to say the glitter by itself is annoying, but probably not dangerous. But when we consider whether any of this is criminal, it depends on what you do with it and why. People have lots of different motivations for sending a glitter bomb. They may want to do it as a prank, a joke, or even for revenge. But in some cases, glitter can lead to serious criminal charges. It is alleged that the two Florida women in question, Caitlin O'Donovan and Sarah Franks, went to Jacob Collins' apartment at three o'clock in the morning to argue with him about something. We don't know what the argument was about, but while he stood on the balcony, the two women threw a container of glitter at him, hitting his head and torso. Franks then scaled a fence, broke into Colin's apartment, and threw more glitter at Colin. When Colin was covered in glitter, Franks let O'Donovan into the apartment, and she threw yet more containers of glitter at Colin. Franks then kicked a window until it broke and then left the apartment. The smoking gun tracked down the arrest affidavits, which revealed that Colin had called the police and gave them a description uh, of their car. Police found the car, which was unsurprisingly, covered in glitter. O'Donovan and Franks were charged with felony burglary and assault and battery. Franks got an additional charge for criminal mischief. So while the story is definitely more than just throwing glitter at someone, the crux of the argument here is that they went to someone's apartment and threw glitter at them. And so to understand what's going on here, we have to talk about the law of assault and battery. Assault and battery are criminal charges as well as civil torts. In the criminal context, a person commits battery if they intentionally cause a harmful or offensive contact with another person. In many jurisdictions, an assault is an attempt to commit battery. In other words, any intentional act that causes another person to fear that he or she is about to suffer physical harm would be considered assault, while the battery requires actual physical conduct by the person or an extension of that person. The police report here says that the two women hit Colin with a flying object, multiple jars of glitter. If these facts are true, that's potentially battery. And here, the alleged facts suggest that these acts were intentional, since the women and apparently rolled up on Colin's apartment, already armed with several containers of glitter and then, you know, covered his apartment and his person with glitter. It might be hard for them to claim that they were just headed to his house in the middle of the night for an evening of hardcore crafting. And the police charged both women with burglary, which in Florida is defined as entering a dwelling, a structure, or a conveyance with the intent to commit an offense therein. Okay, so it's not that surprising that under these facts, you can be in big trouble for breaking and entering into someone's house, assaulting them with glitter, and 
breaking a window. Still though, this is not the kind of situation where you would expect the perpetrators or the alleged perpetrators uh, to be facing life in prison. And there's definitely a, a conversation to be had here about the carceral state that uh, we tend to only ratchet the penalties for crimes up and not down. And we tend to over incarcerate people. This is a large and systemic issue that we face. But the thing that I want to talk about today is a little more lighthearted. What about all of these other glitter attacks? How could they possibly be legal? Well, to answer that question, let's consider the legal implications of Mark Rober's holiday package glitter bombs. Because every December, Mark Rober spends Christmas cheer by getting back at package thieves. Honestly, these are some of my favorite videos of the year. Uh, Rober engineers a glitter bomb inside of a box that looks like an ordinary package. Once the porch thief picks up the package and opens the box, it detonates a glorious spray of glitter and aerosolized farts. This is NASA engineering at its finest. Uh, but so far, none of these thieves have sued Rober, nor has he been arrested. Doesn't his act intentionally planting a device that explodes glitter in someone's face meet the traditional definition of battery? Well, the answer might surprise you. And to dig into this, let's look at the Texas law since that's where Mark Rober's original video took place. And we just talked about assault when someone apprehends, uh, immediate bodily injury or contact, and battery refers to the actual bodily contact, whether it's harmful or offensive. And uh, the Texas statutes uh, tend to mirror the generalized definition of uh, assault and battery. Under Texas law, intentionally or knowingly causing physical contact with another person, when that person should know or reasonably believe that the other will regard the contact as offensive or provocative is a misdemeanor crime unless committed against a public servant. So as with most things, we have to start with intent because intent is almost always a requirement of the crime. And here, did Rober knowingly cause physical contact with another person? Well. Seems like it. He planted a device that he knew would cause glitter particles to hit or almost hit another person or their property. And while these glitter bombs haven't caused any physical injury, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that being covered in glitter and fart spray is offensive or at least provocative. And if you think it's wrong for a thief to have any human rights whatsoever and to be able to complain about anything, well, you should probably watch my video on the shotgun booby trap case, which is based on the very famous case of Catco versus Briny. In that case, the Briny family owned a boarded up farmhouse in Iowa. Marvin Catco and his accomplice broke into the building and stole old bottles and fruit jars. The Brineys posted no trespassing signs, but the burglaries continued. That's when Edward Briny decided to take matters into his own hands and he mounted a 20 gauge spring loaded shotgun gun in a farmhouse and rigged it to fire when a bedroom door was opened. The bedroom window was also covered with steel. In 1967, Catco and his accomplice broke into the farmhouse, and this time, Catco went into the bedroom, tripping the trigger wire. The gun fired into his right leg, blowing away most of his tibia. And while Catco was convicted of burglary, after serving his time, he sued the Briney family for assault and battery. In 1971, the Iowa Supreme Court decided the case and the Supreme Court found that the rule of law to be applied was this. One may use reasonable force to protect property, but may not use a means of force that will take human life or inflict great bodily harm. The fact that a trespasser may be acting in violation of the law would not change the rule. And the only time the setting of a spring gun is justified is if a trespasser is committing a felony, a violence, or one punishable by death, or where a trespasser is endangering human life by his act. And so a jury awarded Catco $20,000 for actual damage damages plus another $10,000 in punitive damages. And remember, this was the 1960s, so that was quite a lot of money. So it's probably an open and shut case against Mark Rober, right? Well, probably wrong. That's because unlike a shotgun booby trap, a glitter bomb package isn't going to kill or seriously injure anyone. Under Texas law, a person who is accused of committing a battery can avoid liability if the act in question was committed in defense of their property, if the act was reasonable and not lethal. Rober's glitter bomb is not at all like a shotgun mounted to a bed set to kill an intruder. Under Texas self-defense law, you're not permitted to use deadly force to protect your property. However, you can use non-lethal and reasonable force to protect your property from thieves and trespassers. So it's a good thing the glitter bomb is just glitter and fart spray because if he sprayed the person with acid or bleach or rigged a package to fire a weapon, explode or release a pit of vipers, that probably would not be justified. It would also be a lot less entertaining to watch on YouTube. One might make an analogy to anti-climb paint. Anti-climb paint is slippery and prevents someone from climbing wall. Now, I'm only covering one of the many potential defenses for Mark Rober here. There are, I think, a bunch of others as well. But the main thing is that Mark didn't climb into some innocent person's house, break in, and start throwing glitter and fart spray. In the eyes of the law, Mark Rober is not a criminal. At least about that.
If only we could talk to Mark Grober to find out what he was thinking. Okay, you gotta help me out here. You gotta clear my name. Who else is gonna glitter bomb these thieves? Mark, I told you not to use the snakes. All right, the, the man himself, Mark Rober. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for joining today. Good to be here. Let's get to the bottom of this. Out of curiosity, at this point, how much glitter and far spray do you think you've gone through? Like in like what metric? Like by by pounds or by like number of boxes? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you're a NASA engineer, so uh, you know, gr kilograms probably more than pounds. <laughs> we gotta stick with freedom units. <laughs> uh, we're talking probably like forty four pounds of glitter, so that's like twenty kilograms, give or take. Of uh, don't quote me on that ish. Uh, kilograms of glitter and I would say probably we've gotten like 50 boxes stolen or something Wow at this point and I know that you've gotten law enforcement involved both in the porch thieves and on tracking down some honest-to-goodness scammers who were taking advantage of uh, you know sometimes the elderly um, has anything come from that uh, coordination with law enforcement so we've literally had like Department of Justice like FBI, Homeland Security, Scotland Yard, Interpol, like all of them at some point in some capacity have reached out, um, including like, I think it was like Microsoft's fraud team, like companies as well. We will just give them our information. We're just like, here you go, do with it what you want. They generally don't follow back with us and, and say what happened for whatever reason. It's not necessarily a two-way street. If we're looking for like, with like local jurisdictions, like this year, we're going to work with San Francisco PD and, and kind of tackle the car, uh, people smashing and grabbing uh, cars and like stuff from cars. So if we're working more like that, then, then there is more back and forth. But otherwise, uh, we just kind of just give them all the data and let them do with what they will. They have told us they like what we're doing, A, because it's like we do stuff technically that they just want for, don't have the resources or abilities to do in their department. But B, we can get away with stuff that they can't do because we're like private citizens, I guess. But somehow they could use that information. So it's like in certain cases, they'll be like, no, we love what you're doing. Please keep doing it. For whatever reason, they're either legally or constrained from a resource standpoint, can't do it. So they love when we f feed them whatever we get. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's a great example. Uh, y you know, the police are bound by the Constitution. Uh, the <laughs> Lame. <laughs> yeah, theoretically. Theoretically, they should be bound by the Constitution. And, you know, you get people saying, oh, that infringes on my First Amendment rights when it doesn't actually involve the government. And the First Amendment doesn't apply to anything but the government. You are a private citizen. So there are there are rules that um, define what the government can do with information that's created by private citizens. Mark, I noticed that a lot of the people in your videos uh, have blurred faces. Uh, is there a particular reason why why you do that? Uh, we might as well just state it on your channel. I put this in the description sometimes, but sure. basically, if someone doesn't sign a release, I don't. Their their face is then blurred, and uh, I don't want to ruin anyone's life over like a stupid decision to like steal a package. So, by default, faces are blurred. If you see a face that's not blurred, that's because they signed a release, and we went back later and said, "Hey, uh, will you sign a release so I could put this in a dumb video?" And uh, and they've signed it. Are you able to to? prevent future uh, package thieves? It's kind of a case by case basis. There's one two years ago, these two college students took it and uh, uh, they were hilarious. I didn't end up turning their f footage to the police or anything, but then Discovery Channel, we're doing something. So they Discovery Channel tracked them down and then I interviewed them. And I, I asked them like, so have you guys stolen any packages since? And they're like, oh man, I got in so much trouble for my mom and my grandma. And then they're like, you know, someone else, a package came to their house accidentally, just shipped to the wrong address. And he's like, I freaking personally walked that thing to Georgia where, it, you know, where, where it actually was supposed to deliver to. Cause it's like, I didn't want anything to do with this. He's like, I was going to go through hell or high water to make sure it got to the right person. So I was like, ah, well, my job is done here. You know, I think they learned their lesson. Well, uh, Mark, if if Batman had a YouTube channel, I think he would aspire to to do exactly what you're doing. Um, I, I think you're doing really good work. Uh, my final question for you is, if Mark Rober found himself in jail, how would he engineer his way out of imprisonment? <laughs> oh, man. 
man, that's, I mean, what kind of jail is it? I got to know, like, what the weaknesses are, right? And, and, I've, I, and usually, I think those things come down to a little bit of, like, combination of social engineering. You kind of got to observe, know when the guards go on rest, make friends with the guard, you know? Depends on how long the jail sentence was, because also, I'm not going to, like, break out if that gives me, like, 20 more years. So you got to balance it all. But, uh, yeah. But, let's, but let's say you're... You're wrongfully imprisoned for life. You are a completely innocent man, but you have no hope of parole, and you're in you're in Alcatraz. How does Mark Rober Mark Rober his way out of Alcatraz? Yeah, I'm going El Chapo, baby. I'm digging a tunnel. That's all <laughs> invent a machine. That's like the fastest digging tunnel machine, and that's how I'm getting out. I think I'm calling it right now. Maybe there's a collaboration with Colin Furs and uh, and digging his ah. tunnel, digging the tunnel out of uh, of jail. Good point. I feel like I'm, I'm mowing Colin's grass here on this one. All right. Well, if I get one call, phone call from jail, you know who it's going to now. Sorry, mom. I'm calling Colin. Oh, you got a lot of tidying up to do here, Furs. You got a lot of tidying up. All right, well, thanks for the call. And by the way, thanks for uh, being a lawyer and uh, you making me sleep a little bit better at night. Sometimes it's a little sketchy with these things. So knowing a lawyer of your caliber has looked at this and, and cleared my name uh, means I can rest a little easier and there's a higher probability we'll do Glitter Bomb 5.0 and 6 and 7. And who knows where I'll be at when it gets to Glitter Bomb 10.0. But... Now, if I ever get sued, uh, I'm just sending them your way. You're, you're my representation at this point, so thank you. Thanks so much for joining, Mark. I'll send you my engagement letter and you can send me a retainer. Now, that being said, I'm not saying that you should all try to emulate Mark Rober's glitter boxes here. These bait packages are works of clever engineering that take great care not to hurt anyone. And since most of you are not former NASA engineers, uh, you might screw this up. And as a reminder, as always, this is not legal advice. I am not your lawyer. And if you get in trouble, I am not coming to court to bail you out again. Now that said, this video isn't over. My whole interview with Mark Rober is way longer and we go into a ton of depth. Well, literally this year, it was like twice as hard to get a package stolen. We're kind of Batmaning our way to like decreasing porch pirates. Did you ever consider something a little stronger than glitter and fart spray like explosives or ninja stars or venomous snakes. I want a little bit of retribution and I want a little bit of deterrence. <laughs> the whole 20 minute interview is part of an extended version of this video over at Nebula, thanks to today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. And Nebula is the only way to watch my first documentary, Bad Law Words Good. It's a long form documentary where I talk about all the most common legal and linguistic comments that people throw around in everyday life incorrectly. It's a hilarious romp through legal misunderstandings, logical fallacies, and law and order parodies. And it's only on Nebula, which you can get for free with CuriosityStream. Oh, and by the way, we've been developing Nebula like crazy. Nebula now has apps for iOS, Android, Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and Android TV. And all of my videos are available on CuriosityStream ad-free, often with tons and tons of extra content. My fellow creators and I really care about Nebula because it's a place where we can experiment with content and put things on there that we couldn't put on YouTube. And we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream because they're the go-to source for the best documentaries and long-form educational content on the internet. They even have an entire section devoted to unsolved mysteries and crime. So if you like my videos, you will love the stuff on CuriosityStream. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial. It's free for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And right now, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's less than $15 for the entire year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. So if you click on the link that's on screen right now or the link that's below, you'll get CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off, or you can go to curiositystream.com slash Legal Eagle. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly. And it's the only way to see my documentary, Bad Law Words Good. So just click on the link that's on screen or in the description. Plus clicking on that link really helps out this channel. And while you're there, click on this playlist with all my other real law reviews. So click on this link or I'll see you in court.